Hi, I'm Doug Vogt from the Die Hole Foundation. It's March 2019, and uh, uh, this video is close to the end of Series 4. After this video, we're going to cover the, the scientific reasons of why the Earth's rotation stops and then goes in the other direction. I've gotten a number of emails from people and also comments that you want to know why, because you're dealing with momentum and stuff like that. And you, don't, you, you deserve a real long um, explanation. So I'm going to give you a, a scientific one using the theory of multidimensional reality. If you're just coming to these videos uh, on the Ice Age and Polar Reversal, you could probably see the first one in Series 4 and go from there in sequence. Uh, it also helps if you see Series 1 on the basic theory of multidimensional reality and how I found the clock cycle. Remember, without the philosophy of science, the philosophy, I couldn't have figured any of this stuff out. There's no way. That's why no one else ever figured it out. They had the wrong theory of existence. They had a matter theory of existence. What I've developed is an information theory of existence. Anyway, this video is going to cover the carbon-14 dating issues. There's a couple of things I left out in the previous video, and I'm thinking of redoing parts of it anyway. Uh, geometric reversals and the extinctions, why the two of them are tied together. Creation of new species, really want to know that one. And then and this also tied in with the sun. You'll know, you'll know why. Antarctic evidence of the nova. OK, so um, one of the things I covered in the previous was this Clovis age dating, which they had the dating older than it appeared because the archaeologists got involved in this thing back in uh, 90, 96, 97. And so what you saw in the previous video of how they altered the information was pretty bad. They shouldn't have done something like that. Logic was just bizarre. Anyway, we'll start in. Now, I'm going to try to explain some of the carbon-14 dating and why it appears the way it is before it's un uh, altered by their new calculations. So I'm going to quote some of the things. This was an evidence of an ex uh, extraterrestrial impact 12,900 years ago. So they're all off about a thousand years on both sides. For example, the Anclovis stratum, Younger Dryas boundary, is well dated at the Murray Springs, Arizona, eight, eight days average, 10,890 carbon 14 years. Now, this would be a period younger than the reversal that I'm saying happened roughly 12,000 years ago. So, why are they getting a date that's roughly a thousand years newer than it should be? That's what I'm going to go through here. Ignore this, this nonsense, because uh, I, I showed how they massage this data. It's just beyond stupid. Uh, 12 dates averaging, carbon-14 dates averaging 10,940. Again, about 1,000 years off. Another article replied to Van Holzen, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Impact-related Young Dryer's boundary, nano diamonds. Uh, in the Netherlands, okay, and this is the reference for it. I'm going to give you the references for each one of these things. If you ever want to see the, the articles, write to me under info at Die Hole Foundation, and I'll mail you the, PD, the PDF of it, if I have it. <clears throat> Based on eight radiocarbon dates from the Murray Springs, average 10,000, uh, 10.89 plus or minus 1,000 years of carbon-14 dating. Okay. And... Greenland ice sheets and stuff like that's where they got the ice cores. Cosmic impact or natural fires at the Younger Dryas boundary, a matter of dating and calibration. Uh, moreover, the, state, the statement that we use a value of 10,900 plus or minus 30 cal, that's their, that new measuring where they take a carbon-14 dating and they massage it to come up with a higher number. For those onset uh, Younger Dryas is Incorrect. This age is not in our report. It was the previous guy fudged his numbers and lied. We report an average age of 11,000 to 10,900 carbon-14 dating years. So he's not accepting this nonsense for good reason. But he's still off by mine a thousand years, and you've got to find out why. I'm going to give you the logical reason why. The UH and associated wildfire at 
I can't pronounce it, it was 10,870 plus or minus 15 carbon 14 years. And this is how they, how they added 2,000 years to it, which is ridiculous. And clearly younger than the black mat were Kenneth et al. found nano diamonds 11,070 plus or minus, again, about 1,000 years newer than I know this thing happened 12,000 years ago, and you'll, you'll know why. Uh, this article proceeding cannot provide evidence of a cosmic impact 12,800 years ago. A lot of guys started jumping on this idea and criticizing them for trying to say that there was an impact 12,800 years ago. There is no evidence for it. Younger Dryas impact model confuses comet facts, defies airburst physics. This guy really carved a new rear end. Uh, try to see it. The proceedings from the National Academy of Science has the volume and the date. You can get these on free. You can read all of them online free. Uh, that's what NS, uh, PNAS represents. Presents evidence that they indicate support major air burst and or impacts at the beginning of the Younger Dryas. <coughs> the start of the Ice Age. That's what they mean. This is the cooling period after all hell breaks loose in the sun novas. And that, that's the ice age. As proposed by Firestone, this guy's name shows up quite a few times regarding this incorrect dating. One of the major crit uh, criticisms of the hypothesis has been the lack of any physics-based physics, physics -based model for the hypothesized event. In other words, they have no scientific proof of this thing ever happening, of an airburst to do that kind of damage. This is what's going on. Um, I have to use my globe, my trusty globe, but this is how carbon decays over time. Its half-life is 5,730 years, I remember. And, but what they don't know is during the time of the Nova, you're gonna have a big spike. Now, 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. And the theory is, is that a, co uh, a cosmic ray hits a nitrogen atom, knocks it off, and becomes a carbon-14 isotope. That's the theory, and I assume they're right. So all of a sudden you have a spike. So you're gonna have younger dates than you really did have. And you have to adjust for that. This is why, now, Back to my globe. <clears throat> I had this picture earlier. This is sedimentary evidence um, done in China. The Chinese and the Indians, you can see here, they saw the sun when at Nova. They, were, they saw it. Indian mythologies are very good. Actually, it describes the sun as at Nova. And it was right along here. This stuff comes from roughly around here in China. But here you have 13,000, probably, but it's below this area, 15, I think it's meters below uh, or centimeters below. So they're about 1,000 years older than what it really is. The, the Nova happened 12,000 years. And all of a sudden you have a, a carbon-14 dating of 7,900. That's a 4,000-year difference all of a sudden. And above it, you have 10,000, 11, et cetera. So why did this happen? Sun Novas, bring it up so the camera can see it. Sun Novas, this is the side of the Earth that was facing the sun when it Nova. And it sat there for eight hours. Now, cosmic rays supposedly are almost at the speed of light. We'll, we'll assume they're right. Certainly when you see the light eight minutes later, but then within the half hour, you've got, you've got well cooked by cosmic rays. So there's a high percentage of carbon-14 been created in this part of the world. Then I estimate seven to eight hours later, the Earth starts rotating in the opposite direction. And the dust shell, 17 to 18 hours later, would have been like this across here, the Americas through Brazil. Got it? So, remember the dust shell hits here, goes past the globe, then you have the back side with normal atmospheric pressure, the front side with extremely low. So what happens? Boyle's Law. This side expands rapidly, dragging some of this carbon-14, 
newly created carbon-14 around the Earth to get on this side. And that's why we wind up with some numbers in the Americas that don't make any sense. They're about 1,000 years newer than it really is because the carbon-14, newly created carbon-14, got moved over here because of this, the winds trying to equalize the atmospheric pressure on the planet. So you see, what I'm trying to teach you it's a complicated process. You have to know what side of the Earth is facing when it novid, and then you know 17, 18 hours later, you're going to have some of that new, newly created carbon-14 move to the front side. Not all of it, obviously, because look what happened here. This is really dramatic. But that may be one way of telling, maybe the best way of telling, what side of the Earth was facing the sun when it novid last. There's got to be a pattern to it. The other reason I think China was facing it this is, there was an excellent art, journal article, I didn't reference it here, I should have. It came from the, the article that uh, they found a lot of bones with fission tracks and radioactive elements in them, uh, like this. And that can indicate that that part of the world was facing the sun when it novit, because that's the only way you get this. Uh, that's about it on this. Now, I wanted to show you what it technically looks like when they measure the, the Earth's magnetic field. So this is the reference of where it came from. Uh, James Hayes is an excellent reference, and I've got the journal if you want to read it. Now this is centimeters. How many centimeters down? Uh, it, the type is pretty small. I have to say what it is. But here about 100 centimeters, well, 600 centimeters down, it has a reversal. So the needle went from left to right indicating a reversal. Now, some of these may have been reversals too. Remember, it doesn't have to go to zero. I think it goes like 20 or 25 nanoteslas. We used to call it gammas. And then it would reverse. So when you have a weaker magnetic field, depending on the sample you're testing, may not have enough iron in it to have a residual magnetic field in it. So you can't tell you anything. It may fluctuate a little bit, and that's about all. Uh, and these are his different core samples, by the way. So here, there's one here, uh, about a meter and a half further down. But you see, it's, it's almost immediate, very fast, straight across. It, here's a whole bunch like this. This is pretty obvious. These are reversals, well documented. So here, the other, in, in this thing here, it looks like the deeper he went in Antarctic, uh, you'll see where they are, I'm going to show you in a second. He got better results. I don't know why, maybe the samples he had was a lot better. But probably had more iron in it. But here you can see it happens immediately. It is literally, when I say God's Day of Judgment, it is literally in one day. By the way, I've gotten some criticism. The minute I mention the word God or religion, it turns off the atheist. If you're an atheist out there, or a scientist or something like that, Look at this academically with an open mind, because if you have a closed mind, you're never going to figure this stuff out. You never will. You'll just waste your time. Anyway, this is the samples that, that Hayes had, had generated. This is another test from another scientist. Uh, I can't remember his name. Paleomatic study of Antarctic deep sea cores. And again, you see 500 centimeters down, or or five meters, an immediate turn. Here, here, same thing here, about the same distance. Here he's got one at 200 centimeters, then 350, then reverses shortly. The reason why it's not always uniform is because, remember, the Earth is going to be rotating in two different directions, one way or the other way, so you get different sediment levels, layers. Uh, this is from Alan Cox, excellent also. And this is, it gives you an idea of the different polar reversals. But even though he's generalizing some of them, not exactly. Like here, it's like 10,000 years. He knows he's got a reversal. Well, I'm saying it's 12,000 years. He's got a bunch of readings here, and he's assuming this. And he's assuming this for time, for time which is obviously wrong. So some of these are only like either 10 or 20,000 years between here is what his estimates are. But you can see you've got reversals, normal and reversed, 
constantly, and sometimes they ignore one, and they just accept this one. Uh, it's just the way it is. But you can tell this thing is happening cyclically through time. Here is uh, from the Hayes paper, I believe it was, where he's got one boundary, and you see the sediment layers change. Now, this is actually two different reversals, but he's combined them as one. That's why they use the Greek symbols. Same thing here, tries to match up his various test uh, holes. This was also, now this is where Hayes was testing. There's the tip of South America, there's Antarctica, there's New Zealand, and he does it along the 90, 120, 150, 180 uh, longitudes. And these are the, where the, the samples were located. So he, he really did a huge part of the Southern Pacific Ocean. He, uh, similar, not as organized as Hayes though, but this is again uh, Antarctica, so, uh, South America, this is the tip of Africa. So he's doing South of Africa a little bit on this side also in the Pacific. And we have the same issues of reversal, reverse polarities. <coughs> Antarctic Raelia, that's these little guys. Magnetic reversals and climate change. Um, I have the article. Fortunately, like I told you, I, I Xeroxed a lot of journal articles in the 60s and 70s and, and 80s. Thank God I did. This one disappeared from the journal Science. And I think it's just an accident because they're missing like about 30 or 40 pages. But disappearance of some radiolia closely related with the magnetic reversals during the last five million years. Um, other article, paleomagnetic study of Antarctic deep sea cores. And there's another reference here for you. And that came from here. Geomagnetic polarity changes and the, those are the two uh, uh, reversal periods. Rayleigh boundary. The line corresponds to a one-to-one relationship or the line of perfect correlation. Uh, extinctions and magnetic reversals. There's no question the, the extinctions happen at the time of the reversals. There are a lot more uh, journal articles that say the same thing. Not the few I've shown you here, a lot. Paleomagnetic field reversals and cosmic radiation. Uh, there's your reference. The hypothesis that the additional energetic particle, particle radiation allowed to fall on the Earth when the geomagnetic field is reversed is the causative agency for population changes uh, thus appears untenable. Uh, he's saying can't be. Wait. Unless it is assumed that these periods are associated with greatly increased particle radiation from some external source. This was done in 67. This is before the stuff came back from the moon, the samples. After that, I bet you this guy knew. But they were on to it. They knew what they had to look for. Mass extinctions. This is within his paper, by the way. Um, take that back. No, this is uh, Roger Lewin. Extinctions and the History of Life. Two uh, uh, respected scientists of note are John uh, Skepkorki and David Rupp. University of Chicago. They have one of the most complete data sets of marine fossil records. They discovered a repeating pattern of extinctions. They found that a 26 million year cycle through the past 240 million years is some kind of statistical artifact. So far, the signal refuses to be statistically massaged out of the data. Quote, although it causes me some constant, constant considerable Philosophical anguish, yeah, they can't explain it, says Spikorsky. The, the periodic signal does begin to look real. Radioleans are single celled marine organisms that distinguish themselves with their unique and intriguingly detailed glass like exoskeletons. Of course, you saw the picture of them. I think they like them because they become extinct when the water gets very cold so they can tell whether it's, it's a kill-off or not. Here's what they've been talking about. Uh, here's the, the various pieces, uh, periods of time, all the way back to 488 million years. 
And these are some of the spikes of massive die-offs. Total extinction rate, the 20% there, here. All these are correspond with reversals, every single one, every one of these. This is how the blue line is how many families of, uh, were, of animals were extinct. It's quite impressive. We just want to make sure we're not one of those families that get extinct. That's why I do these videos. <clears throat> the last polar reversal in Ice Age in North America saw the extinction of 57 species of large mammals and 21 small species. They included the, oh, I'm going to go through, you know, what they are. You can read it here. Uh, man's been ruled out because there was a bunch of birds that also became extinct, and they figured that wasn't on their Diener menu at the time. Too hard to catch. Uh, I'm not the only scientist and researcher that figured out that a supernova or a nova did this. Here's a reference, by the way, for these, for these things, what I've said. You can check them all and enjoy it. The article by Dale Russell, here's his reference there, Nature, Volume 229, February 71. By then, they already had some of the samples back from the moon, page 553. Supernova and the extinction of the dinosaurs. These artifacts are not necessarily unique to a supernova explosion. An and, uh, in, in, intense source of high energy radiation is all that is required. Another possibility is an abnormally large solar outburst. He must have been communicating with, with uh, Thomas Gold, who did figure it out. The extinctions were of unusual magnitude and geologically brief duration. Yeah, one day. And may have been accompanied by a thermal drop. Yeah, that's called the Ice Age. The supernova theory does not conflict with the record of extinctions at the Cretaceous ter uh, Tertiary boundary as at present understood. It has merit in that, pay attention, its predicted effects can be compared to the record to a greater extent than some other theories of mass extinctions. This guy knew. He's talking between the lines here that he knows our son did it. A temperature drop was involved in the extinctions at the end of the Cretaceous, and extinctions were of unusual magnitude and geologically brief during and may have been accompanied by a thermal drop. Yeah. The evaporation gives you the rain, it turns to snow and ice because the sun is only producing mostly ultraviolet radiation until it creates this outer dust shell again. So we wound up with an ice age for I don't know how long. Now the earth was a lot closer to the sun theoretically 65 million years ago. So I don't think their ice age was very, very long, it may have been very, very brief and it all melted away. Also, we're a lot closer to the sun, as I said. Uh, these are how we divide uh, time into um, air, air epos. epos. Uh, and each one is associated with a geomagnetic reversal, every single one of them. These are just estimates of how many millions of years. Nobody knows. It's just a good, educated guess. And these are how the periods uh, you know, look. Uh, somebody asked me about... Well, did we have oceans a billion years ago? I'm not too sure we did. I think the oceans came from the volcanic activity and somehow with electricity, it must have uh, created the water from the hydrogen and oxygen and stuff like that. But this is how it's evolved. And this is the important part. Every single one of these periods are, are divided by geomagnetic reversals in each one of these things. And, and that's the part you have to re realize something's happening to change these animals to evolve upward. Here's another uh, printout from one of the, uh, one of the journals. And he's measuring six different major extinctions at the different periods of time, just like the two professors from the University of Chicago had mentioned. This is where they all fall, really big kill-offs. In other words, you may have a normal nova, and then sometimes you have a real big one, and it knows it's cycles within cycles. I don't know why or how, how long. They may be right. It may be 26 million years. It may be a lot shorter than that. We're just guessing it's 26 million years. This is the realia and how they become extinct at a reversal. 
and a new one forms just after that, like here. So these may actually be the altered versions of these, these animals here. These are the animals we're talking about. Here's an example, a reversal here. These die out, this one continues. And you have new ones here. Now some of these may be continuations of some that we think went extinct, they just got modified. Here's a better example uh, from Hayes again. Here's your reversal, die-offs, creation of new species. Creation of new species from something else. Who knows what? This was a creation of new species at a time of, rever of a reversal. Here's more of them. Here's a reversal, creation of new species. These may have been alterations of these species here. This is a poor mastodon that didn't quite make it. Found in Mexico City. First I had to figure out which way this thing was lying, but the way the shadow is, and that's daylight up there, they found it laying down like this, and that must be ribs and bones. Of, I think it's more than just him that's there. Um, again, they carbon 14 day thing, this thing at 11,100. It is 12,000, but for the reason I told you, you had more carbon-14 in the area, so it throws it off about a thousand years when you get to this. After that, it's probably more close to accurate. Um, <clears throat> now we get to Australia. Uh, stretching out the Ossial, Australia Asian microtactite strewn field in Victoria land. Victoria land is down here in Antarctica. Here's Australia. This is a theoretical impact crater. They're always looking for an impact crater to drop all these. This is where they found tactites, those little glass beads all over the place. Now, if one landed there, how come they're not mentioning finding any glass beads up here? Why? You know, the, this is like from 30 degrees latitude east all the way from, to 180 here. I mean, this is a, almost a half the Earth's and this, an impact is not going to do this at all. This is worldwide. These X's also remember more locations found. So this is really glass beads found all over the world. Just have to look for them. But now, what was good about the article is they did a very good job of analyzing the elements in these glass beads. Here's some of the glass beads they found. Really. <laughs> Gorgeous looking little things, little tiny things. Uh, these are all the same elements, silicon, uh, titanium, aluminum, uh, iron, magnesium, manganese, calcium, uh, sodium, and uh, potassium. B and some of the others, this list went like 40, 50 different elements. They did a great job of, of finding all the trace elements are, that were in these things. Concentrations of the Cosmogenic, I don't know why they just don't say isotopes. Beryllium 10, aluminum 26, and neon 21. These are isotopes that are only formed in the corona of the sun. You need that kind of heat to create that stuff. This is the same things they found on the moon. Exactly the same, beryllium 10, aluminum 26, etc., and others. He must have not read those journal articles of the stuff they brought back from the moon, he didn't know that's where this stuff comes from. So all this stuff that they found there, these glass beads, they came from the sun. Same chemical composition of the stuff found on the moon and also that comet 67P. It's just amazing. Um, the dating is just sheer esti uh, estimate, I think is really trying to estimate the, the age of the rock that this stuff was found on. This somebody sent me a link to. <laughs> this is near the French base. I'll show you where the French base is. Here's Antarctica. And it's right there. That's where the French base is. Very close to where this thing says the South Pole is. Right there. So. This is a wave. We don't know how deep this thing goes. It has the size of a guy. And 
you can see the wave kind of pouring over like this. It's a real mountain of water here. And it goes further back. This is even bigger than, taller than this. And we don't know how deep this thing goes. This is ocean water. So why? Well, if you look at uh, the Ross Ice Shelf, if this, some of this melted at the time of the last, before the last reversal, this water would have gone towards China or in a westerly direction, and it would have gone right over where they are. So it makes sense to see this thing, but it froze solid real fast. And why? Because it was on the back side of the Earth. No, it was, it was on the side of the Earth that saw the sun, Nova. But down there, it evidently froze and froze almost instantly. It's amazing. Influence of Asian so solar proton events on the evolution of life. Now we go into the creation of, of new life. There is mounting evidence that past extinctions of floral, spe uh, floral species have occurred near coincidence with the reversals in polarity of the geomagnetic field. Could the, uh, could the link lie in ca ca catastrophic depletions of st stratigraphic ozone caused by solar proton irradiation over a reduced geomagnetic reversal. Going back still further in time, there is more tenuous evidence of a glacial correlation between the polarity reversals and extinctions of both marine and terrestrial fauna. The solar proton, this is all from his, his, his one article. It's in Nature, 1976. Already this stuff already came back from the, the moon. They analyzed it. They knew what, they knew what was going on. Um, Solar proton hypothesis, he's talking about a nova here, between the lines. On the other hand, provides at least a tentative explanation of this mysterious relationship. This guy knew. Reed, I know, knew, and the other ones did too. There's three other guys that wrote this article. The mechanism we have described may have had the dominant role in some of the massive floral extinctions that have occurred in the distant past. Like I said, He's writing between the lines. He knows the sun novas. Corn is affected by heavy cosmic ray particles. This was done in 1963, before we put any man up to the moon or circle the earth for a long period of time. They wanted to find out if the cosmic rays would damage the DNA of the, of the astronaut. Corn seeds of special genetic stock were recovered from two satellite flights, and the plants grew from them were examined for abnormalities. Some evidence for a slight increase in cro chromosomal deletions was observed, which was predicted from the flux of heavy cosmic ray primary particles. In other words, they knew, they had a theory, they wanted to test it, they knew that cosmic rays alter or damage the DNA. Now, the survivors, us and some of the animals, if you're in the open, and this thing happens, and the nova happens, and you get a dusting of cosmic rays. It depends on how much you get, and I think that's hit or miss, but assume plenty. It may kill you. But if you're in a cave or some large pyramid, there was a bunch of pyramids in China found, and I'll show them when I do that section, uh, then you probably don't get a bigger dose and survive it, but you are slightly modified. Here's the evolution of the horse, going back to, they think, 55 million years. From a small animal to larger to larger and how the foot developed. This is all because of genetic mutation. And I think it's from the sun. It's the only thing that could do it. Um, this is a graph in one of the, the tables I have that basically shows the extinctions and the creation of new species. Mankind. This is all genetic mutation. I have no question about it. This is how it happened. Geomagnetic polarity changes and floral extinction in the Southern Ocean. That's one reference you can go to. During a geomagnetic polarity reversal, the loss of magnetic shielding during the possible zero dipole field, that means magnetic field goes to zero condition, and consequent excessive cosmic radiation at the Earth's surface could lead to Increased rates of genetic mutation. They know. 
Possible climate and biological impact of nearby supernova. Gee. Uh, again, Gary Hunt. Nature, 1978. Everything came back from the sun and the moon. They knew, they knew the sun did nova. The possibility of biological consequences of the re reduction in atmospheric ozone through these supernova events will be catastrophic for certain species as DNA, which carries the genetic information of the cell, is especially modified by exposure to ultraviolet radiation. The only thing that's affected by ultraviolet radiation, they've tasted this, is amphibians that lay eggs in the water that are translucent. Then the ultraviolet light does affect them. Why he only focused on that tells me he knows. The only thing that affects man, mammals, even egg-laying mammals and birds and reptiles is cosmic rays and maybe on the eggs, maybe gamma rays. I don't know how far they penetrate, but one or the other. But certainly cosmic rays do. Why did he just say this? Because I think he's writing between the lines. Otherwise, he doesn't get any more National Science Foundation grants. Okay, so... Um, Astronomers observe rise and fall of dust shells of Nova V339. The reason I put this here, it's almost the end. I had a couple of Novas that were, fell up right on the timeline. We just found another one. <laughs> this V339, and they gave it a distance of 3.9 parsecs, which converts to about 12,700 or so light years away. Now, there's an error in the formula that does the redshift. In fact, they were using ultraviolet light for this thing because it was giving off mostly ultraviolet light. Like I said, the star Novus is going to give mostly ultraviolet light. Well, that's what they did. And there's an error factor of about 10%. I found one from the Earth to the first blank period is about 2.5 or 3%. So with, a let's say, a 6 or 7% error factor, this thing winds up to be 12,000 years ago. So, discovery in August 2013 of V339, Delphinia is a bright nova in the constellation Delphinius. It is the first nova that has been observed to synchronize, synth synthesize lithium, providing the first direct evidence of the supply of lithium to the interstellar medium by an astronomical object. V339 Delphinius shows that one month after its detection, dust formed formation uh, commenced in this nova. In other words, when the star first novas, they probably just see this star getting bigger and bigger, not releasing, they're really looking at the dust shell. When it got big enough, then they realized, okay, we got a dust shell. They probably saw the star in the middle of this thing. <clears throat> the data collected from over two years of observation allowed the researchers to distinguish an apparent rise and decline of the mass and radius of dust grains around this stellar remnant. You know, as I finally recognize the dust shell that the star gives off when it novas, this is exactly what I said. The team noted that the rapid dust formation occurs around the 34th day of observation and afterwards. The infrared emission became dominant by the dominated by the dust. In other words, the dust is hot. And it wasn't 34 days. This thing, you could have, well, maybe because of our distance from this thing, we couldn't tell until it got big enough to see it, and that took 34 days. Next size and mass of the grains increased rapidly while the temperature dropped about 1,000 degrees Kelvin, uh, peaked around 100 days after eruption, and finally declined precipitously after the, this peak. Of course, when the dust had got far and far away, it cooled down. Star was 12,000 light years away. That's when this thing erupted. So we have a third or fourth star noving exactly on one of the timelines. Unfortunately, this was right on 12,000 years ago. Scientists catalog near 100 uh, dusty globulars in the Crab Nebula. Again, this is showing stars when it gives, when it nova, it gives off its dust shell, this matter shell around this center modulation point. Researchers from Sweden have recently studied the presence of dust in the Crab Nebula to locate and characterize numerous dust globulars of this well-known supernova remnant. As a result, they have cataloged 92 dusty 
globulars and derive their properties. Moreover, as the dusty globules origin of dust in supernova remnants is still uncertain, they can't, fi I'll translate for you, they can't figure out why the star of Nova produces this dust shell. Where's the dust coming from? Why? <coughs> Detailed studies could not better understand the process of dust formation. The researchers found that the globulars are distributed over the entire nebula. I think they photographed this under ultraviolet. And these yellow circles here are the stars that they found. These are stars. So this nebula is just loaded with stars. God knows how many. Now, remember what I said, when a star novas, uh, its equatorial region expands and blows outward along this planetary plane. So they matched up with the optical vision of the Crab Nebula, these points, and the direction of which this dust shell was going out. And you can see it, <laughs> all of them, different directions. <laughs> it's hilarious. These, I think, are these right here. You see what I mean? These things all nova, and they all blow out. That's the end. Uh, the next video is going to be on, like I said, proving that why the Earth's rotation stops and goes in the other direction. And then finally, I'll get to part uh, uh, five of series four, which I will be covering how to save yourself, the two ways to save yourself from this event, which everybody's been asking me for, but I wanted to take it in sequence, and this is just the way I do my research. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Um, if you have questions, you can send me emails at info at Foundation. Uh, and that's about it.